our job to keep the government open, just like it's a pilot's job to fly the plane. He's got to show up and fly it. We've got to show up, pay the bills, keep the government open, and then negotiate our differences. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Maryland. Once again, I want to thank Senator Boxer uh, for her comments and for her just strength of coming to the floor and pointing out uh, what the danger and harm that's been caused by the government shutdown and the risk of defaulting on our debt. Let me make it clear. What we've asked for is open government. Keep it open at the level that the Republicans uh, had uh, in their budget as we continue to negotiate. Uh, we want to negotiate a budget for FY14. We want that budget to be fair. We've been trying to do that for seven months. We're not going to negotiate a budget in the next 48 hours. It's going to take more time than that. We need to extend the ability to pay our bills. That should be done for a long time, for a longer period of time, because of the uh, predictability here. We don't want to go from crisis to crisis. Now, there should be no concessions for either one of those two issues. That's opening up government and paying our bills. Let's work back and forth, Democrats and Republicans, on a budget in which there will be give and take. And that's what we're encouraging our colleagues to do. Uh, I uh, joined Senator Boxer in hoping that there's a productive meeting at the White House today, that we find a game plan that will allow us uh, to open government, pay our bills, and a way in which we can sit down and negotiate the FY14 budget. Uh, respecting each other's views and, and doing what our political system always envisioned, and that is tr true compromise, particularly when we have a House controlled by Republicans and a Senate controlled by Democrats. With that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to continue the series of comments that my colleagues have been making about the situation we find ourselves in at this moment with our government shut down and with the possibility of a default on the payments of our federal government. Uh, this situation is virtually unprecedented. To be in a situation of near default. Now, I want to step back from the immediate arguments over what the answer looks like to just understand that we've wandered far, far outside the normal orderly lines of legislative debate. Legislative debate is like a baseball game. Folks come together, some want plan A, some want to oppose plan A, and one team wins and one team loses. Well, in this case, we can go back to the health care debate. And when some folks wanted a health care plan that would put millions of folks without insurance into insurance and have a number of systematic reforms that would help Americans to end abuses in the insurance industry. They wanted to create competition between companies so that customers, that is citizens, could compare policies and thereby get a better deal and encourage the companies to drop their prices. So this debate now goes back quite a while to 2009, 2010. And the side that wanted the improved health care won, and the other side normally say, well, we'll be back next year. We'll get, go back to the baseball analogy, we'll be back with some changes in team members, and we'll debate this again. Well, instead of calling to have another legislative debate down the line, those who lost asked for the umpire to declare that the losing team had won. Now this is acceptable. That is turning to our Supreme Court and asking them if we had violated any of the constitutional provisions that guide our nation. 
And in this case, the answer came back, and the answer was no. The health care plan was constitutional, would go forward. So now the losing team, instead of saying, well, we're going to go debate this with the public, we're trying to go and get our point of view across and get people elected who support it, said they said, you know what, we are going to hold the crowd hostage and threaten to burn down the stadium. Now, if you're attending a baseball game, you know that that's outside the normal rules of competition. And we create these rules in a democracy so that we can have an orderly process by which to consider the viewpoints of our constituents and make decisions. But threatening to hold the American people hostage, that's outside the rules. Threatening to have our national government default and burn down our economy, that's outside the rules. And yet that's where we stand today. Great harm, even as I speak, coming to our communities across the nation. Now this harm may not touch some of the members of this body who may have the financial foundation to not be particularly concerned about what happens to others. But I would encourage them to go live a few days in a working class community and find out how this really impacts families across our nation. We have not only those, those families that uh, work for the government and they are not getting their salaries, they're being furloughed, but they're not then spending their funds in the local community, which creates impact on all kinds of other groups. But it isn't just in, in that direct employment. You have a situation with, say, those who are affected by food stamps. And if uh, the day, first day of the month comes that food stamps are available, they don't go to the stores and buy groceries, and the grocery stores are affected. And the list goes on and on in all kinds of ways. In fact, I can turn to my home state of Oregon and note some things that, that maybe folks here haven't considered. I have here a letter from the Port of Astoria. Now, the Port of Astoria, in order to receive ocean-going ships, has to have its slips dredged to a certain depth. Otherwise, those ships can't dock. And this letter basically is about how the government shutdown is affecting their ability to dredge and how the inability to dredge may have a profound economic consequence on the community. So the, the port writes that every year the Port of Astoria is required to dredge to maintain operations. They've done that in various ways for the last 23 years. And the, the letter goes on through all kinds of details of the process uh, through which dredging occurs. But on the third page, it gets down to this. Our biggest, and I quote, our biggest issue at this stage is the government shutdown has prevented our consultation with the National Marine Fishery Service. And without that consultation, they cannot satisfy the ESA requirements of Section 7 of the Clean Water Act. The letter goes on to say, this is the only element that is holding us up. Well, you may think, well, uh, they don't dredge on time. What's the big deal? Well, to Astoria, it's a very big deal. I continue with the letter. If we are not able to dredge soon, this port and this community could suffer immense economic damages to the tune of five to six million dollars of direct economic funds per vessel that fails to dock, or about ten to twelve million dollars of direct economic impact per month based on the fact there's a couple major vessels per month. The letter goes on to say, furthermore, if a vessel strikes the bottom of the river, the industry, our investors, our clients, our tenants will be in an uproar and our entire business will be blacklisted on the international trade market. Wouldn't that be terrible to have a ship hit the bottom and have the port of Astoria completely shut down as a result of the fact that they cannot consult, as they point out, the heart of this, their ability to consult with the National Marine Fishing, Fishery Service. Just one sizable impact for a community. There are thousands of these occurring across the country. Let me take another example. We have a company in Oregon that produces a particular device that it exports and it needs an export license to do so. Otherwise, it cannot send its items abroad to its customer. And right now, it has a big stockpile of a shipment it needs to send out. Well, they can't get the export license because government is short, shut down. Now this is creating a big cash flow issue because they cannot receive the funds until they ship the item. 
which means huge damage, potential damage to the, to the company. In other words, something that may not have been thoroughly thought through. What about the rural areas in our states? Some will be surprised to find out that you have a lot more government workers per capita in rural areas than in urban areas. Now, many parts of my state are forested, and the forests are owned either by the Bureau of Land Management or by the U.S. Forest Service. It's owned by the national government, in other words. And if the folks are not there because the government shut down, it has a direct impact. In fact, right now, the U.S. Forest Service is issuing directions on how folks who are in the middle of logging have to shut down, skid the logs they've cut, quit falling anymore, and basically clean up and clear out in the middle of an operation. Well, that doesn't just mean losses for the company that's, that's logging. It also means a loss of saw logs for the sawmill, which means layoffs are shut down at the sawmill. Well, you can start to see how, how the consequences roll through the economy. How about the Superfund site in the Portland Harbor? Intense effort going on to get a plan to be able to clean up that Superfund site. Negotiations underway between the, the industries that, that populate that stretch and the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, it's very important to move forward and meet deadlines. But how are you going to move forward if the folks are not at the EPA? Now, if we go back to timber company, it's not just the immediate impact, it's the impact a year out. Because the folks who are planning the sales for a year out can't plan those sales if they're shut down and if they're furloughed. They can't plan those sales and they have to have teams of biologists and folks evaluate every aspect of every sale to prepare it, put it up for auction, can't put it up for auction, company doesn't buy it, there's no cutting, and then those, the logging companies and the mills are, are hurt. This is not acceptable. What we have is a series of fiscal irresponsibility by the group within the Senate and the House that have been blocking the budget and appropriations process. Fiscally irresponsible. Let me lay that out. It's fiscally irresponsible to block the budget committee for the last six months from having a conference committee. And yet, a small group have come to this floor and repeatedly objected to the conference committee meeting. Well, without that budget, you can't have common numbers for the Senate and the House. That blocks the spending bills, known here as appropriation bills. So the spending bills can't be put together, or if they're put together, they're based on a different number than the House has, which means those become deadlocked. Now, that leads to a continuing resolution, which means to continue doing what we're already doing, rather than a, a new spending bill. Well, that's a waste of money, because it means we're going to keep doing things that we know aren't working, instead of doing the things that we know are working better. That's why you have an annual appropriations or spending process, so you can cast aside the things that are not working and do the things that are working. So it's wasteful to block the budget and appropriations process. And then we have this government shutdown. What does this mean? This means less income because there's less economic activity, and it means more expenses because more safety net responsibilities, which means more deficit and more debt. So this group that is blocking the budget appropriations process is responsible for increasing the deficit and increasing our debt. And then let's fast forward to the, the threat of not paying our bills. I think everyone in America knows it's family. If you don't pay your bills, your credit score goes down, and you have to pay a higher interest rate when you borrow. It's same with the federal government. Now, there are some in this body who have said, well, let's make sure we pay our treasury bonds, make good on our debt obligations, and let's just not pay other obligations. Well, anyone who has had a credit score knows that no matter what obligation you fail in, it becomes part of your credit score. It raises the interest. You can go for your home loan and say, I've always made my house payment. And they're like, yes, but you didn't pay your utility bill. You didn't pay your car payment. That means you're a higher risk. And you're like, but I always paid my house bill, always paid my mortgage. Doesn't matter. It shows that you're stressed and you're not 
have a consistent exercise of responsibility in paying your bills. So there is no easy out. Despite my colleagues who have come to this floor, this chamber, and said it's not a big deal, they are simply, to put it, wrong. If they had come to the Committee on Banking, they could have heard expert after expert after expert say, essentially, you're wrong. All your bills matter. All your bills affect your credit rating. And when your credit rating goes down, your interest rates go up, it's very expensive to the government, and it's wasted money, money that's buying us nothing, nothing. It's just paying more for the borrowing that you have to do. And it's not just government that pays. It's the families that pay. They have to pay higher interest on their mortgage, higher payment on their home loan, uh, if, you, if you will, uh, their home equity loan, higher payment on their, on their car loan, higher payment on their business loan. Everyone wastes money because of this group of incredibly uh, uh, irresponsible, fiscally irresponsible members of the House and Senate who have brought us to this point. I can see my colleague has come to the floor, and I'm sure he has stories from his state, and he has his insights on why this is an unacceptable, irresponsible place we find ourselves. Now, all we really need, all we need is a short-term continuing resolution at this point to reopen government while we negotiate. And we should have a long-term resolution of the default issue, because that is something that should never be threatened. It's Ronald Reagan who said, do not mess with the good faith and credit of the United States of America. It's time everyone on both sides of the aisle listens to what, what President Reagan said, because he was, he was right on on this, that that is just a shoot yourself in the foot, self-inflicted wound that does no one in America any good at all. Let's return to the normal process of understanding there are bounds on the legislative debate. If you lose with your perspective in a legislative battle, you can come back again next time round. You can come back the next year. You can come back two years later. You can come back three months later if the votes shift. You can propose amendments, but you do not, you do not hold the crowd hostage. You do not threaten to burn down the stadium. You do not hold the American people hostage and you do not threaten to burn down our economy and our international standing by proposing that we not pay our bills. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Connecticut. I thank my colleague from Oregon for speaking so forcefully and ably about the real life stories in his state, stories of people affected very directly by the shutdown and the prospect of the greatest nation in the history of the world failing to pay its bills on time. And as powerfully as he spoke, so did our colleagues from California and Maryland, emphasizing again the evidence of how deep and broad the cumulative effect is of these shutdowns. I had occasion to speak to people across Connecticut, as I know my colleague, the presiding officer, has done over the past 10 days. And he and I have to talk about how Connecticut is affected and about the individuals there who have borne the burden of this shutdown. And as in Oregon and California and Maryland, there are real life stories of people who have been affected, not just temporarily, but lastingly and enduringly. And I had occasion over the last 48 or 24 hours to talk with many of them out of the glare of the public eye, privately, candidly. And I want to tell some of their stories today, beginning with a meeting that I had this morning in East Hartford at BFW Post 2080. Three, at the invitation of my good friend, Commander John Hollis, of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and a group that he helped to invite. Veterans of conflicts ranging from Korea to Iraq to Vietnam to Afghanistan, 
all ages, all races, religions. More than 20 of those veterans telling me their stories and imparting to me their message. Get the job done, reach a bipartisan compromise, and make sure that the government opens and ends the shutdown and pays its bills on time as befits the United States of America for which they fought, the nation that they served and sacrificed to keep free. I was joined by young men like Michael Wellington Conus and Jordan Massa, Michael Scavetta, David Alexander, veterans of the most recent conflict in Afghanistan, and John Hollis and Ed DeTore, and Lester Yarmel, Richard Kennedy, Mel Houston, Lucian Miles, who have fought in previous wars. As a matter of fact, Michael Wellitakonis has recently returned from Walter Reed, where he had to undergo the latest round of surgery to his arm, which was severely wounded in Afghanistan in combat there. And that wound led him to receive the Purple Heart. He was there with his wife, Camilla, and his three children to talk to me about his fear that he will be denied benefits and compensation that he is due, he deserves and needs the disability claim that he may apply for. And of course, Jordan Massa, also a Purple Heart recipient, as a result of a wound that he likewise received in combat, he waited for two years to receive approval of his disability claim, only to learn on October 1 that he will very likely have to wait longer because of the VA furloughing so many of its employees. And others who came to this meeting, Mike Chavetta from Weathersfield, a veteran who served as an Air Force military police unit deployed to Afghanistan, who needs the GI Bill, which he credits as reconnecting him to a civil society after his return. And he has applied for a higher disability rating with the Department of Veterans Affairs based on his continued experience of post-traumatic stress. Jake Jamaskowitz in Rocky Hill, who has served not only in the Army and in Operation Enduring Freedom, but on his return, now in a nonprofit organization assisting other veterans. 30% of his paycheck comes from the VA's vocational re rehabilitation program, and he receives disability payments. These payments, compensation, claims will run out at the end of October, and the delays are present even now. Discouraging and intimidating these brave combat veterans who have endured so much for our nation, the nation that now has shut down these services because of a small fringe of extremist ideologues in one house of this Congress, one branch of this government that has succeeded in paralyzing the process. There are many other impacts on veterans in the denial of programs that are so important, and many of them I've mentioned on the floor, like the Education Call Center, personal interviews and hearings at regional offices, education and vocational counseling, outreach programs, including at military facilities and vet success on campus. These programs and benefits and claims cannot be sustained by a piecemeal allocation of money. The claims need to be verified by going to other agencies like the IRS. The labor training programs need to be provided by the Department of Labor. Opening one agency 
is no substitute for a comprehensive approach that serves these veterans and the people of the United States, whether it is Head Start children who depend on that program, or seniors who depend on nutritional services. And over these past two weeks, I have spoken to home buyers whose loans can't be processed by government agencies or by banks, business owners whose borrowing can't be approved, potential victims of health threats that can't be protected by the FDA or the CDC, researchers at the NIH and at places like Yale that cannot continue their vital work to learn of new treatments, of advances in medicine that can help save people's lives and prevent suffering. And medical school applicants and PhD candidates whose financial aid is in jeopardy and who cannot even, many of them, travel with government support to interviews for their next possible assignments and study. And these ramifications are not limited to veterans. They affect our economy at its core. I've warned about the effect on job growth and economic recovery. And now it is visible, literally visible, in the businesses and offices and places of employment throughout Connecticut. Just yesterday, in the Connecticut Post, there was this story. The picture is of Robert Imbrogno. Robin Imbrogno. This picture of Robin Imbrogno from the Connecticut Post in yesterday's newspaper is of her at a meeting with her staff preparing for their work, an office in Seymour, Connecticut, that provides human resource services for businesses from California to Maine, across the country, more than 150 business clients. It begins, Robin and Brogno pulled her staff together after work on Thursday for an update. How, she asked, has the federal government's partial shutdown impacted business at her company, the Human Resource Consulting Group? Quote, even more ways than I'd thought, end quote, she said moments later. And I'm going to quote the article. At the company's office in downtown Seymour, the staff, about 30, was having trouble carrying out a host of tasks for their more than 150 clients located from California to Maine. For one, they can't access essential source of information in the government. For another, they can't finish background checks or file equal opportunity reports. Quote, most vexingly perhaps, they got more phone calls than ever on Monday complaining that paychecks hadn't arrived in people's mailboxes across America, even though the U.S. Postal Service is supposed to be fully staffed. Their report is about new businesses that can't open, retail businesses that can't go into business because they can't, quote, procure the necessary business license. And as Robin said, it wasn't a fun phone call. There is evidence of this effect on unemployment in businesses across this country, across the state of Connecticut. This relatively modest-sized business in Seymour, Connecticut, the Human Resource Consulting Group, founded and headed by Robin Imbrogno, is just one of many, many across the country. And her reports about the effect on jobs, we're talking jobs, is a wake-up call for this body. It is a wake-up call for not only the Congress, but for everyone in positions of leadership. 
because this effect will be enduring. This same article from the Connecticut Post talks about the SBA not providing loans to small businesses. $150,000 worth of small businesses in loans every day in one congressional district in Connecticut alone. Eight companies slated to get SBA back loans from a private nonprofit organization that will not receive them because of this shutdown. And there are other individuals, and I can't share all their stories, but just a few. Mary Brady in Durham, who's trying to buy a home and can't do it because she's unable to verify Social Security numbers and income with the Internal Revenue Service. Jesse Parnell, who contacted my office because the buyer of his home in Union, Connecticut, can't process a loan from the USDA because the USDA employees are furloughed and there's no one to process his, his buyer's application. And in the city of New Haven, which I visited over the weekend, urban renewal is halted because of the shutdown. This city relies on the Department of Housing and Urban Development to proceed with foreclosure actions on developers. And those developers are subject to foreclosure actions when they fail to maintain their property, when that property becomes a blight on the neighborhood, but of course the HUD employees are furloughed and they aren't at their desk to help the city of New Haven. This ripple effect spans the state and the country and it goes from loans to a physical therap therapy company, a car wash, a catering company, a dental firm, small businesses that populate Main Street. As much as we focus on the markets in Wall Street, we're talking about Main Street in jeopardy because of this shutdown. These are real life tragedies. There are real consequences to real people, real harm and hardship in real lives. And this body has to listen to them as I did and as I have done over the past couple of weeks. Behind all of this real harm to real people is the prospect of an even more horrendous possible harm resulting from this nation failing to pay its bills on time. The havoc and chaos that would result, the calamity and catastrophe across the globe, the lasting impact on our nation, on our credibility as a world power, simply is unthinkable and unimaginable. How would we face our children if we were to allow this nation to go into default? How would this generation explain itself to the next and the one afterward? Every generation enters into a compact in America that we will leave this nation better than we found it. Just as the World War II generation fought to preserve freedom and democracy and gave of itself in combat and then came back to build the interstate and desegregate our schools and put a man on the moon in peace as well as war, our veterans are coming back eager and ready to contribute to this country. The men I just mentioned and met with in East Hartford at VFW Post 283. Veterans across Connecticut, veterans across the country who expect more from this government and who are eager to leave this nation greater than it was left to them. Millions of other Americans who also are contributing, giving back in their own ways and who are committed 
to following that model of courage and dedication that has characterized previous generations. How do we face the next generation if we allow this great nation to fail to fulfill its most basic obligation that every family needs, paying its bills on time? Winston Churchill said that America always does the right thing after it tries everything else. I know I'm paraphrasing, not quoting directly. Winston Churchill also said that democracy is the worst of all possible governments, except for all the others. We don't have the luxury today of trying everything else before America does the right thing. We don't have the luxury of failing democracy and failing to pay our bills on time. We must meet this challenge and follow the examples of those veterans and millions of other courageous Americans who have said to all of us, as they did to me this morning, get the job done. Make sure that the government of the United States serves the people and pays its bills on time. Mr. President, I yield the floor. It's the absence of a quorum. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Alexander. And here on the floor of the Senate in a quorum call, we've been debating throughout the day the shutdown and debt ceiling, and also going to be taking up judicial nominations, two of them at 5 o'clock Eastern time, and votes on those nominations at 5.30. And a little news about what's been going on on the Hill. Alexander, Alexander Bolton, reporting for the Hill newspaper, has been writing about Majority Leader Harry Reid, hoping to have an agreement to end the shutdown and raise the debt ceiling before going to a meeting with other leaders at the White House. Now that meeting was scheduled for 3 o'clock Eastern time. That's been postponed to give them more time to work on that agreement. Senator Reid commented earlier he was optimistic and here's how the day started in the Senate with the Democratic and Republican leaders. Safe negotiations continue between the Republican leader and me. I'm very optimistic. That we, reach a, we, will, we will reach an agreement that's reasonable in nature this week to reopen the government, pay the nation's bills, and begin long-term negotiations to put our country on sound fiscal footing. I deeply appreciate my friend. Is there any quorum call? As consent to call, uh, call the quorum be dispensed with? Without objection. And Mr. President, I'll be speaking uh, later this afternoon regarding the judges, but I've heard a number of people, including the distinguished senior senator from Connecticut and others on the floor have been speaking of the effect of the shutdown. And we hear, and I appreciate my colleagues who have come here and given real world, uh, real world statements. Too often we hear the numbers, there are X number of people out of work. There's this and that. Well, I was just briefly, actually less than 24 hours in Vermont, uh, there last night, left there for noon this morning. I talked to a lot of Vermonters, many of whom I've known for years, who are 
hardworking people in the government having skills that our government needs. They're very helpful to us. They're being furloughed through no um, fault of their own. And they said, I know I'm getting paid less than the government, but I have a skill, and this country has done so much for me and my family. It's a way to give back. They say, but why? I'm not going to tell my children to do that. They're well educated. I'm not, I'm not going to tell them to do that. We get treated this way. You know what's going to happen? We're going to have a lot of these furloughed people. We're just going to say the heck with it. They'll leave. These are experts at our intelligence service, department of defense, medical research, and other areas. And you know what will happen then? If we try to replace them, we'll be scrambling around, hiring contractors, paying a lot more, and not having the skills that they have. And then the private sector is being impacted. I've used the example of, of a person who uh, has a microbrewery in Vermont, put a lot of money and effort into a seasonal brew was prepared to go with it during what we call leaf peeping season, the fall foliage season in Vermont. But he needs the approval stamp from the Department of Agriculture. It's sitting there. Everything has been done. There's nobody there to give it to him. The number of people who may need a passport for an emergency, family member ill abroad or suddenly have to go there, a lot of that gets issued in Vermont, St. Albans, Vermont. These people get laid off. Those who are need, have questions they need for their businesses, the IRS, normally they can call them up. That's closed. In another area, Mr. President, and they, someone in the press asked me about this just a few minutes ago, what about our court system? Our court system, our federal court system, are facing some very serious problems. If you have a criminal case because of our speedy trial rules, that goes to the head of the line. But we also have, since Gideon versus Wainwright, the fact that you're entitled to counsel. The counsel are not there. Defenders' offices are being closed out. Courts can't just keep asking the same lawyers, we just volunteer your time. Maybe you get paid, maybe you won't. And if you do, it's going to be far less than you make otherwise. And come in here. Now, what happens is those cases start backing up. And then you've got a legitimate civil case that you want to bring. Good luck in the federal courts. You can wait year after year after year after year to bring your case. By the time it's brought, Whatever remedy might have is going to be inadequate because of the delay. If justice delayed is justice denied. And that's happening in our federal courts as the money runs out. Combine that with the shortage in emergency um, jurisdictions. Fortunately, we'll have one judge from Illinois this afternoon. Uh, but these judges, we have, a, a, we have shortage of, of judges because of vacancies and because they're being blocked. You know, Mr. President, I could give a thousand examples, <clears throat> but the ripple effect on real Americans are awful. We see a salmonella outbreak in the West. Well, what we... We know that our Department of Agriculture inspectors out there check us. Oh, wait a minute, they're not, they're furloughed, or many of them are. What do we do there? Ask the areas where there are ports, normally busy ports. Shipping coming in and out, or is it being slowed because you're suddenly with less people? I know when I talk to the FBI, and they tell me about investigations they can't go forward with or can't complete because of furloughs. We had this horrific accident in the South a couple of weeks ago, children killed in a bus accident. 
You know what I found it after as a parent, a grandparent, feeling the grief for those who were lost, the most shocking thing that came out after that was the fact that our National Trans Transportation Board couldn't send a team down to find out what happened and to find out there's other buses with other children on them or other such things might happen because they're furloughed. Anyway, I know with the distinguished presiding officer who has stood up and worked hard on this floor and our caucuses and others to get the government back open and to get us to do the right thing, I'm preaching to the converted. And I see our deputy leader, the distinguished senior senator from Illinois, who has spoken eloquently not only on this floor, but in the national media, the need to go. And so I'll yield the floor so the distinguished senator from Illinois can have it. And I thank him for what he's done, just as I stopped in to thank our majority leader for standing strongly on this to get the government back open. Mr. President. The Assistant Majority Leader. Let me first thank uh, the senior citizen, senator and senior citizen as I am. Uh, from Vermont and the President Pro Tem of the United States Senate. Uh, I just want to say that uh, as Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, it's been my uh, great honor for 15 or 16 years to work with the Senator from Vermont. He's an extraordinary person, an extraordinary leader, and on one of the most important committees in the United States Congress. Uh, I see Senator Barrasso's on the floor here. I have about a 10-minute statement, but if the schedule allows, I'll proceed. Thank you. Mr. President, in just a short time, a little over an hour, the Senate will come uh, to consider two judicial nominees. Uh, I'll speak to one of these nominees from the state of Illinois. The other, I'm sure, will be addressed by uh, other members of the Senate. But I rise today to speak in support of the nomination of Andrea Wood to serve on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. Ms. Wood has the qualifications, integrity, and judgment to be an outstanding federal district court judge. I was proud to recommend uh, Ms. Wood's name to the President of the United States to be considered for this position. And I was prouder still when the President concurred in that recommendation. She has my support and the support of my colleague, Senator Mark Kirk, to fill the Chicago-based judgeship that was left vacant by the untimely death of Judge Bill Hibbler. And let me say a word about Judge Hibbler. Judge Hibbler was one of my earlier appointments, a state judge who uh, really became an important asset to the federal bench in Chicago. His untimely death left uh, an extraordinary vacancy. I was at his memorial service and the tributes that were paid to him for his life of public service uh, were, were truly fitting. Uh, Ms. Wood now has uh, difficult uh, shoes to fill uh, and maybe impossible. But I think in her own special way, she'll make an extraordinary contribution to the court as well. This vacancy has been designated as a judicial emergency by the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, and I'm glad the Senate's moving to confirm Ms. Wood today. Ms. Wood currently serves as a senior trial counsel at the Securities and Exchange Commission Division of Enforcement in Chicago. In this capacity, she represents the SEC in complex litigation matters. She's a native of St. Louis, and she received her B.A. from the University of Chicago, where she was selected as one of the student convocation speakers. She received her law degree from Yale, where she served on the Yale Law Journal. After graduating from law school, Ms. Wood clerked for Judge Diane Wood of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. She then joined the Chicago office of the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis, where she worked on securities, bankruptcy, tax, and other litigation matters. She joined the SEC in 2004 as a senior attorney in the Division of Enforcement, where she investigated and litigated securities law violations, including fraud, insider trading, and other misconduct. In 2007, she became a senior trial counsel, serving as the lead SEC attorney on litigation matters and coordinating with the U.S. Attorney's Office and other regulators on parallel enforcement actions. Ms. Wood knows the world of litigation at the highest levels. She's received numerous awards for her work at the SEC, including the Director's Award from the Director of the Division Enforcement, as well as eight Special Act Awards for her work on individual matters. In addition to her busy government service, Ms. Wood has found time to serve the Chicago community through a variety of charitable causes. 
She appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee for a hearing on June 19th and was reported out of the committee on July 18th by a unanimous voice vote. She's an outstanding nominee for the federal bench. I urge my colleagues to support her nomination when it comes before the United States Senate later this afternoon. Mr. President, I yield the floor, uh, and I see coming to the floor a uh, senator from the other side who has uh, asked for permission to speak, and I will yield at this time. Senator from North Dakota. Mr. President, I'd like to thank my esteemed colleague from uh, Illinois and uh, take this opportunity to offer some remarks on uh, the debt ceiling and uh, uh, continuing operations of the government. Mr. President, I come to the floor today uh, to make an appeal for action, action on opening up the government and action on addressing the debt ceiling. Of course, that requires bipartisan effort. That's something that our colleagues on both sides of the aisle have to work together to accomplish. And we've been negotiating now, and um, not only our leadership, Senator Reid, Senator McConnell, but um, the members of this body, Republican and Democrat, both sides of the aisle, we've been negotiating, talking about um, many different ideas, but now we need to come together and find a way uh, to both address the debt ceiling and, and to get the government open. And the kind of ideas that we've discussed include a short-term extension of the debt ceiling. Certainly, members uh, on my side of the aisle feel that we've got to also address the underlying problems that are leading to our growing debt and deficit. We need savings and reforms as part of addressing that debt ceiling. Also, we've talked about ideas for a continuing resolution to reopen the government, one that follows established law. By that, I mean the Budget Control Act, which establishes budgetary caps that need to be kept in place and honored as part of this agreement. Now, the continuing resolution that we've talked about would also include flexibility for agencies to prioritize spending subject to congressional oversight, but we've got to have budget discipline. We're spending more than we're taking in. Whether it's a family, whether it's a business, whether it's the federal government, that doesn't work. So we've got to exercise budget discipline. Also, we've talked about ideas that might include uh, addressing the medical device tax, possibly repealing the medical device tax, or at least deferring it for two years and pay for it and paying for it with pension smoothing under provisions similar to those in MAP 21. And we've looked at and talked about requiring income verification under the Affordable Care Act to avoid fraud. Ideas that Republicans have put forward, and I think there's been broad support for on the Dem Democrat side of the aisle. So an agreement composed of these kinds of ideas would open government and address the debt ceiling on a short-term basis. But the reality is we need to find savings and reforms to address the underlying problems that are driving our deficit and our debt. As part of a debt ceiling agreement, we need to have savings and reforms that underlie that underlie our problem, our problem that we're spending more than we take in. We can't just raise the debt ceiling for another year, add a trillion dollars in debt to the debt that we already have of $17 trillion. It's kind of like going to the bank. You know, when you go to the bank and you talk to the banker and you say, hey, I want to a loan. I want to increase the loan I have. I want to raise my credit limit. The banker would say to you, well, I mean, he may be willing to, to give you the loan, but he's going to say to you, what are you going to do to address the underlying problem, the problem you have that you are spending more than you're taking in? What are you going to do to address that? And I'm pretty sure if you said to the banker, if you said, well, I'm not going to do anything to address it, you might have a hard time getting the loan, right? And that's true whether you're a family, that's true whether you're a business, and that's true for the federal government. 
So let's put the necessary savings and reforms in place. The president, in his budget, identified more than $600 billion in changes and savings and reforms that he could support to mandatory spending programs. And we talked to him about those time and again. Now is the time to implement those savings and reforms to those mandatory spending programs. I'll give you an example of one that I've been hard at work on for the last two years. That's the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is a mandatory spending program. I'm a member of the Ag Committee. We've worked hard on changes, on improvements, on actually strengthening the Farm Bill by strengthening crop insurance under the Farm Bill, which is what our farmers and ranchers want. And as we work through that at the same time, we've identified on the order of 25 to 30 billion dollars in savings that we can generate by reforming the farm program. I'm a member of the conference committee on the Senate side. The House has now appointed their conferees. We're ready to go. We're ready to resolve the differences between the House and the Senate versions of the farm bill. And we can have a stronger farm program and save billions of dollars. Those are the kind of mandatory spending program reforms that we need to put in place as part of the debt ceiling agreement. And we need to find a common commitment, a bipartisan commitment, and a commitment on the part of the administration as well as the Congress to do that. When we talk about addressing the debt ceiling, that's what it really means. It doesn't just mean raising the debt ceiling. It doesn't just mean borrowing more money, it means fixing the problem. So we need to act. We need to address the debt ceiling, we need to get government open, but we need to have a common commitment, a bipartisan commitment to solve the underlying problems, to get the reforms and the savings that will ensure that we aren't spending more that we, that we're, than what we're taking in. And of course a big part of that is economic growth as well. We understand that. But you know, at the point where we truly come together in a bipartisan way, and I'd argue this is that point, this is that time, where we truly come together in a bipartisan way, I think the markets would react. I think business across this country would react. Businesses large and small would react. Because the certainty of knowing that we truly are dealing with our debt and our deficit would give them the confidence to invest and hire more people. Not only bringing people back to work, reducing unemployment, but getting economic growth. Economic growth, that, not by raising taxes, but with economic growth, broadening and growing the base, generating revenue to help with our deficit and our debt. So I think by putting these common sense reforms, these solutions, savings in place as part of this debt ceiling agreement, a commitment to do that on both sides of the aisle, we will help unleash the power of the strongest economy in the world. And that economic growth will be a huge part of solving our deficit and our debt as well. And it's vitally important that we do it. It's vitally important that we do it. For the strength of our country, to get people back working, and most of all for our children and for future generations. I don't believe that there's anybody here in Congress, in the Senate, in the House, or anywhere else that wants to leave our children a $17 trillion debt. So let's solve it. We can do it, and now's the time. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. I also note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.